Another British artist was to develop a far more extreme image of the rock star as a glittery creature from another planet. Among a number of films that made a deep impression upon me in the 60s, I think one of the most important at the very end was um, 2001, Stanley Kubrick. It was the sense of isolation that I related to. That, in combination with a number of other elements, set the pattern for a lot of the kinds of music that I wrote and the kind of performances that I gave and probably predicted my lifestyle for the 70s. This is ground control to Major Tom You've really made the grade And the papers want to know I was talking with a friend of mine not so long ago about who also came from suburbia. And you're given the impression that nothing culturally belongs to you, that you are sort of in this wasteland. And I think there's a passion for most people who have a, an iota of sort of curiosity about them to escape and get out and try and find who one is and find some kinds of roots, you know. And both of us got out for the same reasons. For exactly that, a desperation and exhaustion with the blandness of where we grew up. David Jones became David Bowie and trained in theatre and mime before starting to do a series of mainly folk-based albums. Apart from the early success of Space Oddity in 1969, his record sold very poorly. Until his wife Angie suggested a bold publicity move. I knew I, had, I knew I had a job in there somewhere, and, and, and it was a dirty job, but somebody had to do it, and I, I was the man for it. Um, or rather, I was the androgene for it. Oh, you pretty things. Oh, you pretty things. Don't you know Bowie was the first rock star to proclaim publicly that he was bisexual or gay. He had already posed for the cover of one album, The Man Who Sold the World, in a dress. Although this album cover was changed by the record company for its US release to an image that was thought to be more acceptable to the American market. Let me say it again, you gotta make way for the home of On his first visit to New York, Bowie met Andy Warhol, and he was to draw considerable inspiration from a group of actors associated with the factory. Where somebody wait for me? Sugar sweet. Oh, he's eating. When I was doing Andy Warhol's Pork in New York, they said Pork was nothing but a bunch of naked freaks running around on stage doing perverted acts, you know. And we were going, yeah, come see the show. <laughs> anyway, when Bowie and Angela came to see Pork and she started to meet all the cast of Pork, people were dyeing their hair purple and green. Lee was coloring his hair with magic markers. We wore our fingernail polish out in the clubs. We wore our fingernail polish on the street. We dressed you know, just as crazy on the street as we did on stage, uh, Angie began to push David in that direction. Without any of that, David would have just continued having long floppy hair and singing folk songs. <laughs> It was not only the Warhol look that had begun to influence Bowie, it was the New York sound as well. Velvet Underground became very important to me. There was this sort of mixture of rock and avant-garde, Kale's influence of avant-garde, and, and Lou Reed's very fine pop tunesmithism. He was a very fine pop writer, and the combination was so brutal. While in New York, Bowie got to know Lou Reed, as well as the irrepressible Iggy Pop, who, in imitation of some of the Warhol superstars, had started to cover himself with glitter on stage. To me, they represented the wild side of existentialist America. 
And of course, had, being a sort of a real nutcase about America and American music, that was everything that I thought we should have in England. I didn't know where it, I didn't know if we had it in England or not. So at that time, one was borrowing heavily from the American influence. But of course, coming being filtered through this British system, it came out in more vaudeville, more Robert Smith <laughs> than uh, MC5. Ah! The result was Ziggy Stardust. Now Ziggy play guitar, jamming gun with weird and killing and the spiders. Ziggy was unveiled to the British public in 1972 in a series of, at first, small concerts. Finally, Bowie had found the combination that was going to work. Ziggy kind of exploded overnight. I think the Ziggy Stardust, David had been working on one way or another for a long time. And it was his sort of alien being, his, his First of all, Ziggy was an alien being. He was like the stranger that we all feel that we are, except he was very beautiful and very uh, seductive, and people wanted to touch Ziggy. David had been experimenting with a lot of looks, a lot of sounds, a lot of styles. None of them had quite clicked until Ziggy. And I think it was really once he got that haircut. Oh, yeah. Now Ziggy played. You're David, right. Bowie's, you're David Bowie's wife, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> what's, it, what's it like with all these girls loving your husband so much? Absolutely here? fabulous. Wouldn't you love to be loved by so many? <laughs> Britain had seen nothing like it for years. Ziggy Fever took over. The key element of Bowie's chart success in Britain was the hard, muscular sound of his guitar player. Mick Ronson could also supply a reflective style of playing that gave the Ziggy character a real depth and range. When I first heard him play, I thought, oh, that's, that's my Jeff Beck. He is fantastic. This kid is great. And so I sort of hoodwinked him into working with him. I didn't quite actually have to tell him in the beginning that we'd have to wear makeup and, and all that. Because uh, Mick came from Hull, you know, and was very down to earth. As was uh, the rest of the spider, you know. What do you mean, makeup? I said, well, I, you know, it might sort of. And so I, I reverted to things like. Um, you looked very green tonight on stage. Do you, if you, I think if you wore makeup, you'd probably look a little more natural looking. And sort of lies like this. And gradually got them into sort of, you know, areas of costume and, and, and theatre. And actually, when they realised how many girls they could pull when they looked so sort of otherworldly, they took to it like a fish to water. <laughs> For me, when I was on stage, I was kind of doing what I had to do, you know? I mean, just as a... I guess what I felt I had to do, what I felt like the way I played, you know? I think a lot of people saw it as a, a very good sort of counterfoil between me and David, because David would be more delicate and a little more woman-like. And I was kind of, like, stomping along on the side there, a bit more like a... I can't really say bricklayer, but uh, that's kind of what I mean, you know? I'm very much a character when I go on stage, I feel. I mean, I, I... Like an actor? Yeah, I believe in my part all the way down the line, right the way down. But it, I do play it for all it's worth, because that's the way I do my stage thing. That's, that's part of what Bowie's supposedly all about. 
I'm, a, I'm a, an actor. The chief ingredients were to um, de-violence the look of Clockwork Orange. Evoke the mystery of Kabuki and no theatre. But if you'd asked me at the time what it was I was trying to do, I had simply no idea. All I knew it was, um, and I sound like a parrot saying this, but it's true, and this otherness, this other world, an alternative reality. One that I really wanted to embrace. I wanted anything but the place that I came from. Bowie started to rely heavily on his manager, Tony de Vries, who surrounded him with all the apparatus and expense of a major star, regardless of the fact that there wasn't always the money to pay for it. Tony de Vries had this idea that if, uh, um, if we just told the world that I was super huge and then, and, and then treated me as though I were, then something might happen. In Britain, the strategy worked perfectly and Bowie's albums sold extremely well. But in America, the real prize market, it was a different story. RCA Records in the States were looking for someone to bolster up their company roster, which had for years relied heavily on Elvis. De Vries sold Bowie to them, saying that Bowie would be a new queen of rock and roll to replace the king. But it soon became clear that a mainstream American audience was not yet ready for a rock star from outer space with a penchant for cross-dressing, and Ziggy made no impact on the US charts at all. <laughs> 